Hey, how you doing? This is David S. Lee, and I'm sitting down and having a chat via Skype with Chris Gordon from Hellblazer Biz. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, wherever you may be in the world right now. You're tuned in to Hellblazer Biz, and I am your host, the one, the only... Chris Gordon! <laughs> Thanks for all for tuning in, whether you be tuning in on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean, TuneIn.com, or Spotify, or Google Play. Last three are new, guys. Well, hey! I welcome each and every one and express my gratitude always for your support. Thank you so much. This week's guest is exciting for me, as not only is he in a film I've been promoting a lot recently, and also which what happened to be the Q&A host at the world premiere... I hosted the Q&A panel with a director and the cast and some specialists in the field of mental health awareness at the world premiere of The Valley. Oh my god, uh, looks like I hopefully, hopefully, hopefully get to do a lot more as well. But anyway, back to the actor. He is still to be seen on the big screen at the moment in Black Panther. That just happens to be the biggest movie at the moment. Wow. And he's also been in other huge hits as well as Get Smart, Geostorm, again films I absolutely love, and many, many more TV shows, films, his list is endless. So without further ado, I introduce to you the most fantastic David S. Lee. Everyone, I have the honour and the privilege and the delight of the company of David S. Lee today. So, hi David, how are you? Hey man, it's uh, my honour and privilege. Why, thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, you are, yeah, it's great, it's great to actually um, talk to you. Um, say the time that you've taken, obviously, the busy schedules as an actor leads, which we've just talked about, it's... Uh, it's great that you can spare the time to talk and, as I say, we've been trying to arrange it for a while, I know, but... The, the way the schedules go, that's health, and that's how life is, which is good because it means. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for your patience, Chris, because it was uh, it was a bit of a choppy week last week, but here we are. Yeah. No. no patience is my middle name. So I'm well, no, it's not. Not not if you ask my wife. <laughs> 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 no, it's cool. So yeah, as you know, I've got a few questions, and we'll just go through some questions and find out a bit about yourself, where you've been, experiences that you've had, and uh, yeah. Hopefully have some chuckles and laughs along the way, which I'm sure we will. Great. <laughs> so, nice. Far away. Going. Excellent. So, first of all, you are a very talented actor who's appeared on our screens in many forms, as I've said. You are, it's a, you know, knowing, I've seen you in many things, obviously, the NCIS LA, things like that. Love every show that I love, pretty much, you've managed to be Thank in. You. Thanks, man. <laughs> You're welcome. What drew you to acting in the first place? Well, um, I was a, a child of a theatrical home. Mm -hmm. um, my mother... Um, who was a single parent, um, was a, or is a, an agent and a casting director in South Africa. Okay. So, uh, she, I grew up within the business, um, and never really decided that I ever wanted to be an actor. It just kind of became a part of who I was really. Mm -hmm. Um, I did plays at school, um, Interestingly enough, I was in boarding schools most of my life at male boarding schools. And um, so all the stuff that I did until I was about 16, I played all the women roles. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, yeah. So uh, I was able to stretch myself already then, which mm -hmm. was super fun. Um, and, then, uh, and then I left, um, you know, I dabbled. I did a bit of, uh, I'd come home on the holidays from boarding school and I'd do some commercials or I'd do some TV shows and... Um, my mother never really forced it on me, and she never really wanted me to be in the business. Mm -hmm. So um, I never got pushed in any specific direction other than what entertained me. Um, I then went into the Navy for my national service right out of high school when I was 17. Right. And, um, and it was only coming towards the end of the, my two-year service that I decided that I wanted to be an actor. Yeah. Um, and so we spoke to a producer that I'd grown up with um, in South Africa um, and um, he put me into a show that they were doing which was a farce um, in South Africa and it was a takeoff of the Chippendales. It was a, it was basically 
the full Monty before the full Monty. Yeah. So I got to walk on a couple of times during the night and take my clothes off at the end of the show. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, this is theater. This is what I like to do. Mm -hmm. I'm in. <laughs> um, and then we had a, um, a, a pretty serious conversation about it. My mom said to me at the time, she said, look, uh, I will come to the show and I will see you on opening night. Mm -hmm. And if I think you have what it takes um, to succeed in this business, I will give you my blessing. Mm -hmm. um, if not, you need to trust me and do something else for a career. All right. And yeah, so it was, um, the stakes are pretty high, but I was pretty confident by that point that that's what I wanted to do and that's what I was happy doing. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, uh, the vote went my way <laughs> and, um, the show was successful. My role was successful and, uh, we went from there. Excellent. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Actually, right after that, we, we, we toured that show for about a year, um, around South Africa and then... Um, part of the deal that I'd done with my mom was that after that show, I would take a break for a year and do something else just in case. Okay, and yeah. involved in um, uh, food, you know, I was in in, in um, food and beverage and in um, catering. Mm -hmm. And um, I worked in hotels and did entertainment in hotels. And uh, about a year after that, uh, working for a... Uh, a, a, a catering company called FedEx in South Africa. Um, the Rocky Horror Show All came right. to South Africa, and they were looking to cast that in South Africa. Right. And uh, so I jumped right back in, and that was basically the relaunch of my career, and the, and the, and the proper start was that. Fantastic. I probably did musical theater and comedy and theater for the first 10 years of my career. Oh, fantastic. Uh, before I got into film and television, yeah, actually. Excellent. Who were you in the Rocky Horror, then? Who were you cast as? So I played, initially I was a phantom in right. the chorus, and I understudied Eddie and Dr. Scott. Um, and then I went on to take over Eddie and Dr. Scott as a double role. Mm -hmm. um, also understudying Rocky. Um, and they flew me in. I had just wrapped on, I'd left the Rocky Horror show after about a year or so, and then I'd gone and to do another show in another part of the country. And I was home for a weekend and they flew me in. Rocky was on tour mm -hmm. and they flew me in after about four months of ha having left the show. They flew me in to actually play Rocky for a weekend because awesome. uh, the kid playing Rocky had concussed himself. Oh. And, um, <laughs> And there was some other, there was something else, someone else was missing in the cast or something. Because usually, you know, there's an understudy format and everybody yeah. gears and takes a step up, and, mm -hmm. as you know. And somehow they didn't have the numbers. So they flew me in to play Rocky for the weekend, which was so much fun. Um, <laughs> I, I used to thrive on that. I understudied um, characters. That's pretty much how I learned a lot of my work was understudying in every single show that I did. Excellent. And working your part and then everyone else's parts as well. Yeah. Um, the workload and that whole that uh, story of the show must go on mm -hmm. and it was just man, I lived I lived for that. I thrived for that. David, can you go on tonight? So and so is concussed. Yes, I'll fly in. I'll save you. <laughs> <laughs> Save the whole thing. That's brilliant. I mean, I love Rocky Horror. It's, it's one of the classics of all time. I just there's a few things I'm picking up on what you've just said because I was like the first one, obviously Rocky Horror. I remember at uni we had Rocky Horror Night. Now I was in my I was what 18. I must have been 18, 19. So we would obviously you dress up, don't you? Rocky Horror. You have a Rocky Horror. Everyone dresses up. Of so I'd gone to one of the, my girlfriends in the in the in the college, and I, for starters, I was I've got, I was actually chuffed, and the girls were all astonished because I was a size 10 at the time. <laughs> but I'm at, we, yeah, me and my friends, we all did everything. Up, we got completely dolled up, and they cancelled the film showing. Um, oh, no. <laughs> it was that we were in the middle of nowhere in Wales in in the university, and it was a very tight knit, close knit community. And they have one <laughs> film night on a Sunday, and they cancelled it. So oh. me and my friend, we'd all dolled up as obviously you know in the suspenders and everything, okay. and we thought sod this. So we just went down to the student union bar, and <laughs> <laughs> dressed up. And the looks we got were hilarious because I was in the office of training corps at the time anyway. So everyone was oh. just like looking at me, going, "Really?" <laughs> it was just like That's I thought brilliant. you're supposed to be open minded here. <laughs> Oh, brilliant. It was absolutely hilarious. But um So so what was the officer training call? Was that part of the British military? Yeah, it's um it was just like um the territorial reserve army. 
So, oh, okay. So while you're at university, you can train to become an officer, and you can either at the end you can do the qualification and become an officer in the army. Right. So I did the TA thing for four years at uni, which was awesome. Jumping out of Lynx helicopters, I learned how to scuba dive oh, in brilliant. Cyprus. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it was good yeah. fun. It was awesome. Uh, the other things I was going to say, when you said back in boarding school and you were playing the female parts, I was going to say you could just join, you know, you join in the likes of Shakespearean era, because that's what they yes. did then as well, you know, it's no exactly. different. Yeah. yeah, because my voice, my voice took forever to break. Um, <laughs> and I think that was part of it. I used to sing soprano in the school choir, um, geez, until I was like 15 or 16 or something. I, I still had, and then suddenly my voice started breaking. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was, uh, yeah, it was, I was just the, uh, the little round kid who just looked pretty in a dress. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's take it back a few hundred years to Shakespeare's era, and that's what the, everyone was doing, all, you know, yeah. when all the males were dressing as the female characters. So, <laughs> there yeah. you go. <laughs> they laughed the women off the stage. They did. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it was very stupid back then, but yeah, never mind. <laughs> that was another era and another time. <laughs> yeah. So how did you? F- what was it? What was the? What was the film when? And she, uh, the film. Uh, she wants to be. She wants to act, and they all laugh at her because it's a woman, and they're like, ah, "You got to act. You're a woman." What was it? It was, was that Shakespeare was in Love. It, was it Shakespeare in Love. Yeah, with Gwyneth Paltrow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, why did you use a woman? You a woman. <laughs> we, women can't act. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> It was crazy. Yeah, this is amazing. The mentality of certain, you know, of of, of people going in the ministry, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Uh, wait, imagine if the the current situation, the current days of today, with obviously, you know, the the, the power that's out there and the actresses we've got. Yeah. Yeah. If if they'd never been allowed to do anything, it would have been crazy. <laughs> if we carried that on. Yeah. <laughs> That's why that's why we move on. That's why you evolve. <laughs> yeah, excellent. So, how did you find the transition? Because obviously, you moved from LA. From you moved to you know the US from South Africa. How did you find that transition? It must have been quite yes. a big big leap for you. Oh my God, it was. Um, I had all kinds of delusions of grandeur and adequacy. Not so much adequacy, more more so grandeur. That I was going to leave South Africa when I did. I was I was pretty much headlining. I was doing the Blues Brothers show. I was doing uh, I Love You, You're Perfect, Now Change. We were doing these great shows, and I was finally um, top of the billboard. Mm-hmm. And um, I figured it was time to actually make the leap um, to America. Um, and... Uh, I, I thought I, you know, I, I had this fantasy of coming over and you'll be the new kid on the block and everyone will be excited to meet you and they go, oh, we got a great, oh, yeah, yeah boof, right away, here we go, put you on a show. Yeah. And and, um, and there was so much going against me at the time, um, and I only realized that when I got here. Right. So um, a number of things. First of all, I didn't have a visa yet. Okay. And I only applied for the green card once I came to America. Mm-hmm. Um, and we got a bunch of different visas to stay and et cetera. So that set everything back. And I took meetings with some great agents. I was at William Morris and I was at ICA, ICM and I was at, uh, uh, just in some great rooms. Yeah. And, um, and the feedback was good, but it was all, you know, and I had, I had, you know, my, my resume at the time was about three or four pages long and it included all the theater that I had done and mm-hmm. just a, a whole lot of stuff and um, my headshots were like, eh, you know, they were okay, but rushed, nothing, yeah. care, nothing caring. And, and, um, and then of course, uh, you know, and the visa situation and my, my reel was really very poor. I had a tremendous, I had done a ton of work, but I hadn't done that much film and television mm-hmm. and I hadn't, didn't have that much material to show what my film and television side, um, entailed um i had a great commercial reel and but they couldn't really do anything with that um that compounded the fact that i didn't actually have a visa that was ready to go right um, slowed everything down so i um basically was on the back foot right away so after having worked for about 10 years consistently in south africa yeah. having never been, you know a day without a job practically mm-hmm. um suddenly i find myself in a position going well what do i do now so um i did a number of things i uh 
we had to get a bunch of, but, but a, you know, a bunch of cash uh, situations happening. So I worked for a company as um, a secretary and I answered phones for them. Mm-hmm. And they were actually a, um, a, uh, a, a, an editing tra- a trailer company. Okay. So I would do spec voiceovers for them for the trailers. I would do in-house corporate videos for them. Um, and I then also started a dog walking company. Okay. That's very big here, mm-hmm. very big in the States. Yeah. People have their pets and they'll pay you to look after their dogs. And I worked in a restaurant that paid me cash. Mm-hmm. And I got a job as a spinning instructor, okay. which is something that I'd learned to do in South Africa when we wrote a play yeah. about spinning. <laughs> so it all kind of came together and um, I had a whole a whole stack of cash jobs that I was laying out. And um, and I think it took about 18 months of not being able to audition and not being able to get an agent because I didn't have a green card, basically. Mm-hmm. And then my green card came through and then I started getting into the scene and I got a manager and um, started getting into rooms and meeting agent, uh, meeting casting directors and auditioning and just got blown away by how good everyone was mm-hmm. and walk into a room and there's a dozen guys that look like you yeah. who are, you know, 10 times more prepared than you are mm-hmm. and um, they're all nailing it. So if you don't come back better than that the next time, you're not going to get a job. Yeah. Um, so from being a big fish in a small pond, uh, as one would say, to, you know, being a piece of amoeba, being an amoeba in a lake, you know, uh, was pretty shocking to me. Um, but I like to think that I learned the system pretty fast. And, uh, yeah, I got it, uh, got it going, but it was definitely, um, it was definitely a shock. Also the, the size and the um, the amount of people that are involved in the day to day running of everything was also um, quite an eye opener to me. And and they look after you so well, and the union is so organized. And uh, you know, you pay your dues and you pay a percentage of your earnings, and you know, it's a bit of a kick in the teeth sometimes. But the flip yeah. side is you get looked support. after so well. These standard contracts, which you know, if you're if you're touring some, if you're traveling to fly, they'll pick you up in a car. They'll look after you. You know, they. Nice. I mean, you really get babied a lot, and mm-hmm. and I think it's an excess a lot of the time. Um, but hey, I'm happy to enjoy it. <laughs> you know, you've got to be fresh when you when you get on set and when you're working. You have to be clear-headed and you have to be energized and you have to be prepared because there's so many millions of dollars at work around you yeah. that if you aren't prepared for your moment in front of the lens, then everybody else loses because you're wasting their time and their money and everyone else is doing their job. So you better bloody well do yours. Yeah. Um, and I, and, and I learned to understand that a lot more when I got onto these bigger films or if I got into, um, shows and that, that I was on for, for a season or whatever it was or two or, um, or if I was on a, um, a studio set, uh, a studio uh, movie in, uh, on the soundstage. And, and when you see how m- many people are, are hired, you think it's too many, but you realize that it's everyone has their job because they've got to make your job easier, as easy as possible, so that you can get there and focus, yeah. you know, and do your thing and be prepared. So when you have to jump, you can jump, you know. No, fair enough. No, it sounds it sounds like a, a hell of a transition. And I think it's probably something again. Uh, it's probably I think it's the first time I've spoken to someone an actor. I've spoken to you. You'll think your episode you'll be episode 121, so over two and a half years, and that's the first time I've actually heard the difficulty of, of somewhat of going into Hollywood. I mean, I've spoken to British actors who've gone over, but I've not actually really talked to anyone who's made that full move and gone across. So to hear that and to hear because. For me, my dream is to knock James Corden off his top spot in a nice way. <laughs> That's my goal. That's my goal. You've got to have a goal. Um, and I've got to admit, in my head, I sometimes think when I started out, when when I started to, when people started to say that I was good at what I do, because I still think I've got a long way to go. But people start, you know, people compliment you all the way. But they, when it's, people started saying that, I thought, "That's it. I, I can go to LA. 
I, you know, and, and what, exactly what you thought. I could go to LA, but then it started dawning me how many other people do what I do, and how many other people do yeah. it a lot better than I do. And it's like, damn, competition's high. Um, you like you say, you go to LA, and I might be good in the UK, and you know, and people look up to me here for what I've done. But as soon as you go to somewhere like LA, where you know you can walk into a cafe, a restaurant, and I'm not knocking, but the waitresses, the waiters, the cooks, like like you said, you did, gym instructors, you're you're all also actors, and that's you know making a living to get to that same dream. And I think it's because everyone congregates yeah. there. So yeah, yeah, the reality yeah. struck me quite. Yeah, absolutely right. You're absolutely right. You actually have to really pick up your game. You know, um, you got to take it up a level. Um, because everybody's doing the same thing, coming from around the world, coming from Britain, coming from South Africa, coming from Australia. Um, I mean, everybody's New Zealand. They're coming in now. Yeah. Passing to Europe, you know, um, Eastern Europe, and it's the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And, uh, you know, everybody has in their a clear picture in their head about what they think they're capable of. Mm -hmm. I certainly, I can't speak for everybody, but I, I'll speak for myself. Um, and y you know, it's, it's, you can, you get knocked down so fast, Yeah. you know, but then the story is, you know, are you prepared to get up and dust yourself down and do it again and do it better, mm -hmm. you know? And for me, the, um, the difficult part is the higher the pedestal, you know, or the higher the ladder you fall off the more difficult it is to recompose yourself again. Yeah. And um, and the longer you stay in the business, the closer you get to those big contracts, mm -hmm. those bigger roles. Um, and that, that gets harder and harder. So it's difficult at different stages. It's difficult for different reasons. Yeah. You know, you got to get your... You got to you got to get a visa to work here. Mm -hmm. You got to get an agent or manager, some kind of reputation, uh, representation. Then you've got to get in the room. You got to get in the room and actually yeah. meet the casting directors. <coughs> then the casting directors have got to think that you're half decent, so that they'll bring you into the producers, you know, or the uh, the directors. Um, then once they've decided, once casting and the producers like you, then they send your tape to network. Mm -hmm. Then network have to approve you. <laughs> Uh, so there's this enormous progression of all the chefs in the kitchen that need to have their say. And all you can do is go in and do your job. Yeah. Uh, um, until your best friend becomes the head of the network. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've told all my best friends to become heads of networks. I said, that'll have to be. My yeah. mates are like, oh man, what... I'm sorry you didn't get that big gig. What can I do, man? I have to yeah, go to the network. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Get in the network. I know a friend, the actual first person I interviewed, or one of the first people I interviewed, was going to go for a job ahead of one of the, one of the networks. And I was like, right, that's it. I'm, I need to know you from now on. <laughs> <laughs> but it's exactly, yeah. you are right. It's true. Um, I mean, for example, for my toe, I've got an idea. I've got a pitch for a show, so I'm going to put it in a TV. But I know the hard work I've got to do to get there. And... You've just put it right in. <laughs> you just, you know, you just, you have laid out every step that I've got to, you know, I've actually got someone working with me at the moment and saying I've got to do a strategy, which is, I think, the first thing you have to do in any mm -hmm. kind of when you're starting out is that a strategy, and that is exactly that's a strategy. How do I do that then? What would I do if I went to, you know, to get the visa, blah, etc., etc., get the networks or get anyone interested in it in the first place? So yeah, it's um, it's a long, it's a long hard process, but the rewards then at the end of it of that hard work. Absolutely, yeah. Exactly. No, you, you got that right. You know, you you choose this. You you choose this for the for that feeling and that that emotion and that sense of accomplishment when you're actually on set or you're doing a play or um, uh, it, it, because it really is. It's an extraordinary job. Mm -hmm. It really is. It's an extraordinary life if one can can live it to you know fulfillment. Definitely, really definitely. Oh yeah, yeah definitely. Um, and it's you know, I think you've got to have a passion as well because from what everything you said, if you didn't have a passion, and a passion for what you wanted to do and what you do, then it's very easy to have given up and very easy to for people to give up. And I think that a lot of people probably do that uh, yeah. when they're faced with the adversity because they might just yeah. lose the passion. And it's about keeping that flame inside going. 
Well, that's what a lot of uh, when when I have these these young kids come out from South Africa, um, they'll look me up on Facebook or they'll send me a note and they say, "Hey, any chance I can ca catch a, a coffee with you and have a chat about the business?" And uh -huh. you know, and there's a lot of work going on in South Africa right now. A lot of international shows and films being made there. So the, they'll cast the parts in South Africa. They'll cast the smaller roles or the bit parts in South Africa, the local hires. Uh -huh. And then these youngsters will be like, "Oh, I'm in a Hollywood movie. I'm going to go to America. I'm going to be huge." You know? Yeah. And, and uh, so they come out here and they get slapped in the face pretty fast. So I'll sit down with them and I'll be like, all right, so first of all, you got to love what you do. Mm -hmm. If you don't really, really love what you're doing, if you, don't, if you, want, to, if you want to be an actor because you want to be a star, you're in the wrong game. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's, not, it's not for you. Um, you really need to love it and you need to enjoy it. You know, I, 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 that, that feeling of doing theater, you know, that that sensation of being on stage, being off stage, rehearsing, um, having the curtain come down, the smell of the makeup in the dressing room, the smell of the theater when you walk in, the rehearsal room, the sounds, you know, there's nothing like it. And it gets into your, your system. It gets into your every being. And that's what you have to hold on to when you have those difficult days, when you have those times where, man, you know, that could have been me, you know, up there, <laughs> you know. So you have to really enjoy what you do and trust that you're doing the right thing. Definitely, definitely. I mean, I did theatre in school right till I was 18. Because um, mm. for me, that was where I wanted to be at the time. Obviously, you know, the Navy was either the Navy or acted at the time. And I, I just, I went the academic route to try the Navy and that didn't work out. And then I, I thought I realised, oh, damn it. And by the time I got too ingrained then to go back into the acting. But I was in musicals in school. But oh, I got yeah. To, yeah, I was a Smike. I was Nicholas Nickleby, and I was first of all I was Drake the Butler in Annie when I was sixteen, and that's the first time I'd ever been wolf whistled, which was amazing. <laughs> Coming out on stage just to hear wolf whistle. It was my girlfriend at the time, and she was wolf whistling. So I was like, I don't care. That's still yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> it was great. And then yeah, Nicholas Nickleby I was, but I, I, during rehearsals it was my A levels, which like the exams you take when you're 17, 18 obviously for universities yeah. and stuff and I've got to admit I was probably letting the other bits slide because I was so immersed in what I, I it's the passion I had and I kind of yeah. got I got taken off the um, the role and when the, when I went to watch Smike I cried because I just sat there watching the guy oh, replace yeah. I, I was watching the guy who replaced me and I was thinking no <laughs> and, I, and I've got to admit there is that little feeling like you just said of me every time because I love musicals I love theatre um, I love film and TV, but I think theatre for me, like you've just said, I think it's the emotion, it's the smell. And every time I go to the theatre, it just takes me back 20 years to where, even just a couple of times when I was on stage yeah. and the exhilaration and the feeling. And I'll, I'll watch a musical, I'll watch a play and I'll, I'll focus on a role and I'll think, oh, I'd love to be that role. I, you know, yeah. I could picture myself in that role and just think how it would be because it is such an intim intimacy with theatre that you don't get, I think, as much with TV and film. And it's yeah. it is it's just a it's a very unique feeling. I have a uh, I have a dear friend of mine who uh, is British, um, but I worked with him and in, I met him in South Africa because he lived and worked in South Africa and studied there for a long time as well, and then went back to London and worked the West End, and then came came out to the States and got his green card out here, and he lived in New York, yeah. and he's now coming back to the West End, um, okay. to do, yeah, to do King and I. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to think if I've seen that advertised around to see who it was. <laughs> it's going to be, when's he coming? Uh, it's going to be in the next couple of months, I think. So you'll probably see it. Uh, right, Ken Watanabe okay. is the king. Okay. Yeah. And, um, oh, oh gosh, her name is, oh, oh, oh my word. She's an, an award-winning actress. Never mind, it'll come to me. I'll have a look at uh, it. <laughs> obviously, she's playing the teacher, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um... But yeah, it's a terrific show, and I saw him here. But that's, you know, it was always great to go and watch him um, in South Africa. He was always just fantastic, you know. And, yeah. uh, and you know, it was only a matter of time before he got onto the West End, which he did. He did do very well. And then he came to America, and he got on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And I saw Broadway. And, you know, it is, it's like watching, watching your dreams through, some, you know, someone else, your dreams um, through someone else's career. Yeah. And I would love it. I mean, I love that because I love supporting him and I love supporting my mates when they're doing well. And, um, yeah, that was – it's great to see because I love theater. And I, even if I'm just watching it and going to the West End, like you said, or going to Broadway, you know, in New York, it's just – it's just terrific. Yeah. I mean, I was looking if I won, I won a tickets with Sky TV in the UK a few weeks ago to go and see The Ferryman. 
in the West End, which was directed by Sam Mendes, about oh, the yeah. family in Northern Ireland. And it was, it, I mean, tick us what five rows back from the stage, and and it was it was just brilliant, pure brilliance. And you're right, it just you just you just get drawn in. It's just yeah. you know, it's just it's like I say, it's what we just talked about. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, I yeah. could talk about it all night um, <laughs> and all day for you, so, but I won't. <laughs> But I've Thank seen, you. yeah, sorry. I've seen some TV actors as well who I know as well from Constantine, and I've, I've seen them on stage. And you're right, it's, it's like you say with your friend, seeing when, when you see someone on the screen, then see them on stage, and just seeing because they came from Shakespeare, John, Joe, O'Neill and Matt Ryan, they were, and they, you know, they've both got Shakespearean backgrounds as well. But and just to see the difference from, you know, the, the portrayal, it'd be like seeing you on stage because I'm sure, obviously, seeing you in the Rocky Horror Show will probably be completely different. To it, which is completely different to seeing you doing some of the roles that you've been playing. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So moving on to another question. Then um, I'll skip a few. Don't I? <laughs> just, it's great. I told you it's rambling away. It's great. Is there a particular director that you'd like to work with? Ooh. Um. Yeah, um, you know, I suppose there is. Um, I'm going to actually put a, a list to that. <laughs> I'll have to come back to that. No problem, no problem. I mean, there's quite a few. I mean, that's, they're very unique in different genres, so. Yeah. Yeah, okay. If you could play any role or any character in any production, what would it be? Any role in any character in any production. Yeah, your dream role, basically, isn't it? Um, gosh, I love... Um, oh, there goes my chair. Um, Leave Schreiber. Okay. Uh, plays uh he does uh that show um oh my god uh it's only now <laughs> a second um that for me is that's a that's a great role yeah um it's 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 intense and it's uh the guy is just i can't remember the name of it. Uh, i know what you mean as well but that's... <laughs> um hang on I'll ray donovan it. oh yes 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 ray... Ray Donovan, yeah. yeah, that's a great show, but uh, it, it's very intense in that. But um, I, I think what I, I mean, I love comedy. You mm -hmm. know, my background is comedy, and and I thrive in comedy. Um, and I love action stuff. Yeah. And you know, so you know, X Men, you know, uh, here here, uh, fantasy stuff, X Men, Marvel stuff. Um, mm -hmm. That's a great TV show to do. Um, gun uh, uh, toys, you know, horses and guns and swords. <laughs> and yeah. I mean, if I, you know, you can get the perfect show, it's something like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a lot of fun stuff. Excellent. Fair enough. Yeah. That's... yeah. And then, and then I got to say, you know, um, um, sitcom is. I love sitcom. You know, sitcom is just so. It keeps you on your toes because that's like TV and theatre blended. Yeah, you know, playing to a fourth wall. Mm -hmm. And um, I've done a handful of sitcom shows. I actually just Netflix had a show that um, um, that I was up for, and it's a super fun role. Yeah. And I'm thinking you can do this because you rehearse every day, and then you shoot in front of a live audience. Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the week, and uh, oh, it's just so much fun. <laughs> yeah, have you seen Miss? Have you ever seen Mrs. Brown's Boys? The UK no, one. No, you've never seen that. Ah, oh, I'll watch that one. That's pretty funny. It's an Irish one. Um, yeah. But they do. They film it in front of a live audience, and it, but it's it's things. You know, they corpse on stage, and they you know <laughs> things go wrong, and it, they thrive on it. And I think the, uh, Brendan O'Carroll who plays Mrs. Brown. Um, he plays the old oh, lady, yes. Mrs. Brown. Yeah, he. he th I've seen them live four times, and what he he's got a perfect knack because apparently he's known for beforehand. He will throw things in ad lib, and he will be determined. And it's his goal to make this cast completely corpse at some uh, point in the at some point in the production, even on the TV shows. And you can see when it's happening, and it's absolutely hilarious. Uh, so yeah, try and look out for that one. You might be able to get it on BBC uh, player over there. Uh, 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 Guillermo del Toro. 
Oh, uh, director. Guillermo, yeah, director. He did uh, Shape of Water. Yes. His films are extraordinary. I find that type of work extraordinary. Such um, visionary in the. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that stuff. Yeah, that's like super fun. <laughs> it is, yeah. It's, it's high, also, yeah. And stuff that I've never done before, you know. Mm. Um. Well, it's very different. His everything that he does is just so different to anything normal that you'd expect. It's yeah. like you say that the visual side of it, just as well Absolutely. as the story, is just superb. Yeah, and then you get like big action films, you know, like directors like Christopher Nolan, mm-hmm. um, who are certainly you know worth getting in line for. I mean, God, Spielberg, you know, these guys who do these. Incredible. I saw the most amazing documentary on Spielberg the other day, and he was always doing these fantasy films, and no one really took him seriously until he did uh, maybe Schindler's List or something like that, you know? Yeah. He just slayed, and it was brilliant. It was. Uh, that was a total shock. I remember that, because that was a real shocker, because yeah. you write Spielberg, yeah, you get SSA yeah. Jaws, you would start you know, all the, everything else yeah. and things like that, and then all of a sudden, whoomph, out of nowhere comes this yeah. the most powerful one of the most powerful visual films I've, I've, I think I know of yeah just yeah, <laughs> the little girl in the red dress I saw was oh, <laughs> just every time <laughs> just yeah. yeah so so tragic um I mean, films are something that you've been in. Block, you know. You I mean we'll go to, to blockbusters in a minute because you, you you've not you've not had your uh, shortage of blockbuster movies that you've been a part of. To be fair, I know the one, one of the ones I'll talk about quickly before we go into them is the Valley. Now, this is one you have been in recently. Was the reason why I reached out to you in the first place, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. How has it been? How was it feeling? Obviously, in that film because it was a very different type of. Um, atmosphere i think in the in what it was trying to portray so well yeah that was um that was actually that was a, a gift because um uh sailor um and uh suchitra uh we basically had a um uh, sailor is the the writer director and um yeah. and uh Suchitra's Suchi, the lead actress, yeah. Suchi plays the lead yeah so they Basically, they cast me off my um, off my resume. My agents um, sent the casting my resume. They really liked what I'd done, and so we had a Skype session, mm-hmm. as we are. Yeah. And we met over Skype, and we just had a discussion about things. And um, I didn't know anything about the movie. Uh, mm-hmm. They sent. They, they told me about it, and then they sent me the script, and um, and they wanted my character just to be me. You know, they wanted him just to be no accent, just who I am, this guy who gets involved um, with uh, Suchi's character. And um, I, I was, I, I was only up in Northern California for like a, for a couple of days, I and mean, they flew me out there. And uh, it was a very fast-paced um, visit. Yeah, uh, it was a small budget film, and they didn't have. Um, a lot to go on. Um, but, um, and it was, yeah, it was really, really great. Um, you know, the small, the bit that I played, um, he's a guy who, I won't give, try not to give any spoilers <laughs> here, but, um, you know, it, it's something, it's against most other character roles that I played. Right, yeah. Uh, which is a, one of the reasons why I took it. Um, I hadn't, I hadn't done anything really like that before. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so to be in it and it was a beautifully written script. Uh, Definitely. the characters are lovely and warm and, um, and, uh, Sailor was just so charming and she was mm-hmm. so sweet, um, when we met and, um, she, she we were chatting away and she, she, she sort of turns, turns to Suchi and goes, He's very good looking, isn't he? <laughs> like, oh, thank you. <laughs> so it was like chit chat chat. Oh, he's very good looking. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So um, they said, no, we think you'll be great for the role, and if you want it, it's yours, and come on up. And so we got up there and we played, and um, um, 
the character, the storyline, the character, the um, the influence that he has in the life of Suji's character is still mm-hmm. there. But I know, uh, it's my understanding is that they they took out some of the work that we did. Um, I think they were just running long, running long on on time in the movie. Yeah. Um, and they didn't need all of the stuff that we had. We got the idea of what was happening, mm-hmm. and they didn't need all the all the other stuff. Um, so um, I, I think I'm still in it, but it's um, fair. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's gone down. <laughs> I think it would have been yeah, great yeah. to see that, like you say, see that rest of that character in there. Um, yeah, it was a nice character, and you know what? Um, that that that's also that's that's the movie business for you. Yeah. You know, <laughs> especially if it's a smaller film. Uh, you know, they shoot a lot of stuff. They had a lot of a lot of stuff to shoot in that story. It's a beautiful story. The family that it revolves around the, the family tragedies and and the and the love of the, the the family that they have, the unity that they have. And it's such a um, a poignant film for mm-hmm. this time that we're living in right now, actually. It is. And I think we shot it uh, a couple of years ago, um, but it stands strong for today's commentary. Uh, 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 a commentary on society as well. So, Definitely. Um, yeah, it's, I think the timing of it's terrific. Um, it, it seems to be getting really well received, and um, and uh, uh, it's getting lovely reviews, and which is so nice. It's so nice they got it out there. You know, it's, yeah. it's so seldom that you get a small film that that actually gets out into print. Exactly. So, I was about to, yeah. and accolades that they're receiving is just terrific. It I mean, is. They did a job. It looks beautiful. I was about to say that as well for the accolade because I was, I, I had the honour. I've met Sailor and I met Ali Khan as well uh, a couple of weeks ago because I, I had the honour of um, a few. I think something spiral into what you do. I went to a premiere about four, four or five weeks ago for another independent film in the UK. I interviewed the director and he invited me to the premiere in, in Soho. And I went there and then from there I got introduced to a chap called Mark Busby, who is the distri- film vault, who's distributed The Valley as well. Oh great! And he, yeah. said, he says I'd like to work with you. And next thing I knew, I was actually hosting the Q and A panel after the Valley Film premiere, world premiere in Soho two weeks ago. Brilliant! So Brilliant. we had Sailor Ali, um, it's got Ol- Ollie Regan, it's Sharon Roberts were on there. They're they they were uh, they're forefront in the mental health awareness ex- extreme, oh. you know. So they were giving that uh, impression as well. So the yeah. I think the the message from the film is really taken. And it's because there, the, there were ambassadors for mental health awareness in the audience. They've been invited as special guests. They've come yeah. down and and, it, and it's been, like you say, the reviews have gone and it's, the film itself is being picked up. Um, and obviously your character is a very key character in it still. And I won't spoil yeah. it for people who haven't watched it, but there is, <laughs> that is a, it is a key character. Yeah. So, um, you know, it, that, it, that film is really sort of taking up a lot of gravitas at the moment. It's getting yeah. screened in various places. And like you say, for an independent film, to have that ability exactly. it's, and it's going to get a premiere in India as well it's going to go out in India uh, it's yeah. going to have the US I think it's going to be soon as well so it's, it's it, there's a you know it's it's great and like you yeah. say Sailor's lovely because I met her at the time and I've spoken to her on my show and and then we then met her in person she is she's just so she's driven lo- lovely lovely yes. person yeah so great and she was always very calm and uh, and um, you know very very soothing yeah, definitely. Yeah, we definitely. Had a, like you know we were. Uh, it was interesting because we, you know, I was taking the character one direction because we didn't really have much rehearsal time or much time to to discuss it. We literally it came came up within a few days and then I was up there with them, and um, so we were we you know we were um, we were changing horses midstream um, a few times. You know we'd go through a scene and uh, we'd shoot it and and then we'd be like, okay, wow. Um, you know, do you, do you think, you know, we should bring up a comment? And I'm like, well, yeah, absolutely. And then okay, well, let's see, because I had it going one way, and mm-hmm. I see what you're doing is, is really fantastic, but I don't know if blah, blah, blah. So we'd have very quick discussions, you know, and bang out another shot, you know, go in a different direction and and see if that fitted her um, her vision better, you know, because, again, like, they were, because they were so restricted for time, um, you know, we didn't have a lot of, uh, uh, opportunity to, yeah. to go through it. But, uh, you know, I think she obviously ended up with what she was looking for, which is great. 
really great. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's just definitely the out. The, the it doesn't look like an independent film either because the production quality of it is so good. Quality is terrific. Yeah, yeah. It's got great guys in. You know, Ali is terrific. He was so charming as well, and uh, yeah, very not, charming guy. I remember. <laughs> Suchi's great, and no, that was good. It was, it was, they did a good, good job. Yeah, I've been speaking to uh, Sushitra as well. I, I get tongue tied with Suchi. I also call her Suchi, sorry. It's not just, um, but yeah, I've been speaking to her to try and get her on as well. But obviously, you know, she's like you, so she's scheduled. <laughs> yeah. And Ali as well said he'll come on. But yeah, they were, they were lovely people when I met them. And, and I wish the film success. And we're still pushing it here because it's, like you say, it's very, very poignant for the situations and the, the times that we're living in and trying to break the stigmas of, of that yeah. mental health awareness. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So, I mean, I'll okay, move on to some blockbusters now. Um, I know I'm pushing time, but <laughs> you've, I mean, you've had a few, you've, you know, you've get smart. You've Geostorm, things like that. I mean, how is it working? Steve Carell and The Rock. I mean, you know, those are, You've got, I mean, yeah. Steve Carell, comedy genius, and then you've got The Rock. I mean, I've followed him since he was, what, um, Rocky Malvia in WWE. It, it, yeah, know, right. Is he as charism- charismatic in real life as he just appears? Dwayne. Dwayne, Dwayne Johnson. He is uh, the sweetest guy. Mm-hmm. He is so charming and gives you the time of day. Um, I... Um, I was, I met him a few times before I ever actually worked with him. Um, right. Interestingly enough, I met him um, on an airplane when I was on my way to New York. I was going there to do uh, the Wendy Williams show. Mm-hmm. And, um, and he happened to be sitting in the seat next to me. And um, my, uh, a dear friend of mine, uh, Arnold Fossler, who is a South African actor who played the mummy. Um, oh, yes, yeah. Years ago, him, brilliant actor. Yes, also a terrific actor. Um, knew, knew, you know, knew him and chatted with him, and and mm-hmm. obviously and uh, worked with him. And uh, so I sat down and I saw him. And I went, "Oh, hey, Dwayne. My name is David Lee." And um, I said, "I'm very dear friends with uh, Arnold Fosloo, who was the mummy." And he went, "Oh, yeah." And we chatted, and he said, "So, what are you off to do?" I said, "I'm gonna go." To, I'm doing the Wendy Williams show in uh, in New York, and he's like, "Oh, I love Wendy. You must tell Wendy I say hi, and uh, you know." And I said, "Sure, sure, you know." And um, so I relayed the message when I went to Wendy Williams, and then some time ago, I, uh, some time after that, I was uh, uh, well. Then we did the I did get smart, mm-hmm. you know, and um, and then. Um, and then I ran into him on set uh, on, on, on one of the studio lots um, a couple months back, I think it was, and uh, and he remembered me, you know, which was really sweet. And I'm yeah. like, wow, you know, this is a guy who's in the top of his game in mm-hmm. this business and he takes the time to go, oh, hey, um, tell me your name again. I, I worked with you. You did that thing in the world. I mean, yeah, I'm, you know, so he's just, he's a he's a darling of a guy. Yeah. Um, uh, he's also the size of a house. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's no joke. Yeah, he's <laughs> a monster of a man, mm, okay. um, and really great. Um, and and he was great. Uh, yeah, I was on set sometimes when he, when he was uh, doing Get Smart, and you know it is it is what you would expect, you know. Yeah. Um, and Steve Carell and Anne Hathaway were just a dream. Anne Hathaway. Um, who I do that whole ballroom dance sequence with um, is such a hard worker. She was young at the time. I mean, she was she's young and she's such a hard worker. And between her and Steve Carell, um, you know, we, we all went out for dinner um, after we finished the week of shooting this, that huge ballroom sequence yeah. at Dance Off. Uh, the producers took us all out for dinner and um, I was sitting with Steve and we we're chatting and. And he was telling me about how um, he told the story of how when he went in to audition for Get Smart, mm-hmm. he literally went in with his headshot and resume and he went in to audition and he gets in there and he goes, hey, I'm Steve Crow, Here, here's my uh, headshot. And and, uh, and they went, oh, no, no, Steve, we're offering you the role. You don't <laughs> need to read he, he was just like, so, oh, uh, okay, yeah, well, great. <laughs> You know, and uh, yeah. and he's just, he has such funny bones. Mm-hmm. You know, he has such funny bones. I mean, he, he'll just tell you a story about going in his minivan to pick up his kids, and it's hilarious. <laughs> uh, um, uh, 
And that, you know, I, I would study these guys. Um, same thing when I worked with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio mm -hmm. on the first uh, studio film I did on Blood Diamond. Yeah. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, Steve Carell, and Hathaway. Um, and I would watch these guys and I would think, what is it about them that makes them stars? Mm -hmm. You know, what what is it that they do differently? What is it that um, I can take from them? Mm -hmm. to help me move along in my career. And the one similarity that they all have is that they're all absolutely focused on the work. Right, okay. They are so focused and they're so prepared. Um, that is, you know, it's just such a big, it's such an obvious thing to me, other than, of course, them being either hilarious or gorgeous. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, having a standout quality of energy that they have yeah um you know it was really it was really a um i worked with ed harris um on geostorm mm. and um which also happens to be warner brothers but uh mm. i i did some work with him on that and ed's ed's up in his high 60s now i think yeah it must be and, yeah uh, yeah and uh, we were introduced quickly by the director uh, um um, and, um, we get the shot, we get the shot lined up and everything. And, and it's a running scene. It, it's, he's been looking for somebody and he, he goes, he, he gets so psyched up for the part. He goes, mm -hmm. yeah, he just psychs himself up and he runs up and down the car door and he <laughs> woo, gets himself going he gets all pumped up for the scene. And all yeah. he's doing is running into the shot, giving a look, saying, go find him or whatever the line was. Yeah, yeah. And then. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, he's just been in this movie business for so long. You know, he's mm. such a, a, a pro. He just knows exactly how to get himself psyched up and pumped up and energized for a shot. Yeah. And then get out of there. You know, um, it was brilliant. Dean Dev oh. was just all smiles. Yeah. You know, he's just, he just like, says, David, this is, this is Ed and, and uh, you know, this is the scene and, and we get the shot and go, and Ed's like, uh, 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 Dean's like, great, great, no, nope, got it, good, let's go, let's move on, you know. And uh, and these, you know, these guys are brilliant. Um, they they they're just they're just so good at it, you know. Ryan Coogler, just skipping a little bit, um, uh, who directed the Black Panther, mm -hmm. um, is also someone I would love to work with yeah. down the line, and you know, I'd love to do something with him. Seeing how he works. Um, uh, with Michael B. Jordan, uh, mm -hmm. plays Killmonger, you know, they, that partnership that they have and that intimacy that they have as an actor and a director, you know, uh, it's, it's Scorsese and DiCaprio, you know, yeah. it's that, um, which is another director I'd like to work with. <laughs> um, I know what you mean. It's, it's, it's yeah, I mean, it's it on. I mean, these guys are also, they're so professional at what they do, you know, and I, and if there was one standout thing that I looked at, and that I took away from all of this mm -hmm. was this um, level of professionalism that they all had. Yeah. I mean, I, I talked to a, a lady called Erin Elizabeth Burns. She was in a film called Cell, which was with John Cusack and Samuel L. Jackson. Uh -huh. and, and she mentioned that about Sam Jackson, exactly what you've just said about these guys, because he was so switched on. And she said she was just, she, 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 she kind of just sat there with, almost with her mouth gaped open because there's a scene where her brother had died against... He just, whatever happened, he was, he was against a tree, he'd slumped and he died. And they were just supposed to run off. And she said, spur of the moment, she thought, well, it'll be good if my character turns around to try and go back to just see her brother one last time before they disappear. And she said she actually turned, Samuel Jackson just put his arms straight out because intuitively he was so in the scene as well. He knew what she was doing, he just put his arm around her and said, you don't want to do that, let's go, come on. And that was, that was in the final cut. And it was oh, wow. just, it was just like she, yeah. She just said her jaw was. She had to stop her jaw from dropping on the floor with the fact that yeah. the, like you say, the professionalism of people, of the like that. He, he just, he was in the moment. He knew what she was doing, and boom, straight away worked with her and just said, "No, let's do it." <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, so so aware of the of your actors around you, yeah, your, partners, your scene partners, yeah. And, and I think that's in, in in an actor as well to, to be to be aware of what's going on around you and not just focus on yours so you you know you can yeah. merge i think that's that's really vital um yeah and i know time's moving on so i'll move on to black panther because this is one which you know we've 
this is did you guys as, when you're filming it did you realize how special and amazing the film was it's just a basic question like that you know um no uh, i certainly didn't i knew it was going to be big yeah uh, um, because it had so much coming into it but here's the thing is i i never read a script they, they wouldn't give out a script oh, okay. Uh, okay they play their cards very close to checks mm -hmm. you know i when i read for it I read a couple of a scene. It was a couple of pages, and it was a great scene. And uh, um, I ended up getting offered the part. And um, and then when I when I got my sides, when I got onto set, and I got my special secret luck box, and I, I, I opened that online, and and I didn't know where the scene was, and I couldn't find the scene. And I went, oh no no, that was just written for the for the auditions. You know, that was okay. just an audition. Um, the director just wanted to see, you know, that you had a, a, a South African accent. He wanted to know, mm -hmm. know that you could, you know, portray this character without saying too much, just by being who you were, just looking the way you do. And, yeah. and um, so I didn't know what the script was. I didn't know any of that. And, and a lot of the guys, uh, you know, I'm sure Michael B. Jordan did, and I'm sure Chadwick Boseman yeah. did, um, and Andy Serkis who's uh one of yours yeah true and, um yeah and um and um but in in filming it and actually once we were on set you know the the energy that ryan kugler had generated with the cast and the mm -hmm. crew uh was such that you knew it was going to be an extraordinary film yeah uh, uh you knew that that you know, you meet, you walk on set and, you know, and you meet, uh, obviously, Michael B. Jordan and you meet these guys and everybody is so dialed into what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And um, yet they all have the, 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 the time, you know, to acknowledge you, you know. Um, uh, Martin Freeman uh, was just terrific, you know, just such a real, again, these guys are just hard workers, you know, mm -hmm. and they're such professionals. Um, they know their stuff and they're prepared to work as, and, and do, do it as many times as you need and, and, uh, and get it done. Yeah. Um, and it was, you know, it was an extraordinary, it was an extraordinary experience. It, it really was. Mm -hmm. Um, the, um, the producers that were on all the time that were on set were also just, uh, so nice and uh so they were also policing you to make sure you weren't taking photographs <laughs> yeah the cell phones were were a no-no and uh, <laughs> nobody was allowed to uh to sneak any photos in and that kind of thing um but it was as as the more the longer i was on set and the more crew members i spoke to um uh you get a very you got a very good understanding of how big this was going to be. I mean, the crew yeah. guys, you know, were so dialed in and, uh, and I, and I, I'm always befriending the crew guys. I mean, that's always kind of my, my baseline of stability is knowing who's around me and who's monitoring the cameras. And, yeah. um, and it was really, um, it was really, and when it started coming out and, you know, you always, you always look, you know, you always want to catch the first trailers and catch what's going on. And, mm -hmm. um, we had um, the there was a huge playoff uh, college football playoff the Rose Bowl um, oh, right. and um, Kendrick Lamar who did the music was mm -hmm. performing at halftime and they were pumping it up on network television about the new they're going to drop the new Black Panther trailer and it's all Ken, uh, Kendrick Lamar is going to be playing at halftime and sure enough he performed and the new trailer yeah. Uh, I wasn't watching at the time, but my phone blew up because I was in the trailer. <laughs> oh, awesome. There was a, shot, a couple of shots of me in and out of the trailer and, uh, you know, of what has become one of the biggest movies of all time. And my mates were just blowing up my phone. <laughs> oh, 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 Black Panda. I went, oh, yeah, I'm in the movie. I went, no, you're in the trailer. You're in the trailer. <laughs> awesome. Jeez. Oh, yeah. Um, and when that started happening, I was like, wow, this is going to be huge yeah. you know it's gonna be and then the premiere was uh was one of the most extraordinary premieres i'd ever been to you know the, mm -hmm. the, the costumes and the color you know everybody was the the, the invitation said wear royal attire <laughs> and um 
so these guys, everybody was just in such great colors and it was just so fun and so flashy and such a great vibe. And the audience with the premiere was just so vocal. Yeah. <laughs> it was terrific. I it really, really was. Yeah. It's amazing to be part of something so big, you mm. know, and I'm such a small part, you know, I mean, uh, I'm in it, you know, here and there. And, um, there was actually one scene that ended up on the, on the editing room floor as well. And again, it was because they, they just didn't need it, you know, yeah. was flying a helicopter or something and they cut away to me and then I'm talking to Andy Serkis. And mm -hmm. again, there's just so much going on and they have to be so careful and, you know, they can't run over and, you know, is it necessary to have that scene in there? Will that move things forward? Yeah. No, looks cool, but you know, no. Yeah. Fair so, enough, fair enough. And, yeah. I mean, and it was like you say, I mean, you might have had a small part, but you know you're a very talented and well respected actor. And I think I've, I've, that's what I read online. You're welcome. That's what I read that online was uh, the fact that you know you've you. I mean, the, you just look at the cast list on the film. You know, Chadwick Boseman, Michael B. Jordan, Angela Bassett, Forrest Whitaker was one of my all-time favourites. He's just yeah. such an amazing guy. Lupita, yeah. you know, Martin Freeman, and and you know, and then I th it said there as well. And they said even. The small characters, you know, those are the, the, the more, well, the characters aren't in it as much, but they said, you know, you guys, you've got <laughs> David S. Lee, who's like one of South Africa's finest, is what the actual thing said. And, you know, and to have someone like you as a, as a, as a, as a more minor character in there, as a, you know, in right, a couple yeah. of times, yeah, someone absolutely. of your stature just to be in there just shows the kind of strength the movie's got. Oh, that's <laughs> terrific. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's very kind. But yes, I, I, I know it's like, uh, you know, to, to have, just get get on that set was quite a you know was quite a win and um, you know you got to celebrate in this business you got to ce celebrate every win that you can that you can you know Definitely. even getting into an audition you know nowadays with the competition being what it is even getting an audition is a win. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because so, like like you said before, it's there's so much out there and so much. It's yeah. very hard, and, it, and yeah. the competition's huge. Uh, I'll, I'll bring you on to the last question now. So uh, okay. I'm sure you're you're, you're quite uh, <laughs> you're probably relieved. Um, we've had a great discussion actually. Is um, lovely, yeah. <laughs> hopefully you'll find this one a fun one. I had last year a guest on my show called Mike Quinn, who was nine, who was nine dumb in Return of the Jedi. You know the guy at the end, Monkey, in the Millennium Falcon with Chewbacca at the end, as, oh, with Lando Carizian, sorry. And they flew off the Millennium Falcon at the end of Return of the Jedi. He's kind of yes. got the red and blue overalls. Uh, but yeah, he's basically been a Muppeteer with Jim Henson for 30 years. Brilliant. And the question, was a fantastic guy, I worked with Kermit, Miss yeah. Piggy, and the question that came up, which I now try and ask everybody, uh, as, as, just as a fun one at the end, is if you could have a Muppet created on your own character... What Muppet would it be and why? And you can have a mix of Muppets. You can have one that's out there or one that doesn't <laughs> even exist. <laughs> well, I've always had an affinity for Animal. All right, cool. Yeah. You know, on the drums. And uh, so um, that, that, that uh, you know, Animal kind of, uh, I, I, when I turned 30, I literally turned 30 for 30 days. You know, I, uh, I really went for it. And a lot of my youth was uh, mildly misspent in many ways, and um, and so I think that would be a pretty accurate part of the character would be animal. Um, and then uh, you know I'd have to say stepping back to my uh, my cross dressing days as a child actor, a little bit of Miss Piggy. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to lie. I used to do a very bad impression of Miss Kermy when uh, of Miss Piggy when I was a kid. Oh, that's mm. okay. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's Before fine. <laughs> so I think it would be Animal Eat Kermy. No, no, Animal Animal Eat Piggy. Animal Piggy. Miss Miss Animal Piggy. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. Fair enough. Animal. Um, yep. Yeah. I mean, that's how my show started. Was doing bad impressions, but I did like er, 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 Piggy. Er, you need to on step. Uh, you need to on set, Piggy. <laughs> that was my little Kermit bad one. <laughs> <laughs> I did, and I did a Yoda, the other one was a Yoda. It was like, hm, when 900 years old, you reach look as good. You will not. <laughs> That's my Yoda. <laughs> Yoda, baby. Yeah. you are. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> See, now, now I feel bad because yours was good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did Donald. The friend in school could do Donald Duck perfectly, but the only thing I could do is... <laughs> That's about as good as I can get. <laughs> That's great. And the oh, sneeze... Is a little Donald sneeze. 
<laughs> you must be able to entertain kids all day long. I know, my, I've got an 11 year old son, and every time we go out with his friends in the car, they're like, Dad, can you do the impressions? Can you do the impressions? <laughs> <laughs> Full time job, man. Oh, Full-time it is. It is. Before I stop recording, David, is there anything like you'd like to say to people who are watching or listening this <laughs> one last thing? Well, man, geez, uh, thank you for listening because without you guys listening, you know, we wouldn't sit down and have these conversations. Um, no, and just live in the moment, get out there and follow your passion, follow your dreams. Do, do what makes you happy and try not to hurt people. You know, be kind to others. David, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. Truly appreciate it. I mean, an hour. Uh, it's, it's amazing. And you're such a genuine, really nice guy. Hope to be able to get you on my show again soon. Thanks to everybody who's listened. As I said, whether whatever form of media you are listening to, you have been listening to Chris Gordon talking to David S. Lee of Black Panther on Hellblazer Beers.